This is a Socialist News and Views special interview. I'm Nick Schillingford coming to you from the Urban Cabin Studios in South Minneapolis with this special interview. So on Socialist News and Views, we let folks introduce themselves. Do you want to just tell listeners who you are? Sure. Uh, well, glad to, glad to be here. Thanks for having me, Nick. Um, I am Samuel Doten. Uh, I use he, him, his, or they, them, their pronouns. I live here in Minneapolis in the state of Minnesota. Um, I'm a lifelong Minnesotan, and I am one of the delegates to the Democratic National Convention. I'm one of 35 uncommitted delegates. Uh, in addition to that, I've been doing lots of work uh, in the Democratic Party, uh, the DFL, as we call it here in Minnesota, and that's uh, spanned things from like being on the board or the chair of Stonewall DFL, founding the Democratic Socialist Caucus, and uh, more recently really having a pretty galvanizing season of conventions uh, through the DFL, uh, forming a progressive delegates network and really getting uh, forces aligned uh, for a better direction in the party. Um, we got a couple of things at the state convention. I can talk about that a little bit later. But uh, yeah, I mean, it's it's a lot of my work has um, been getting progressives and leftists to communicate and work together in the Democratic Party to be uh, as best as we can be a counterbalance and force to um, some of the reactionary and uh, moderate forces in the party that are uh, extremely risk averse to doing things um, really needed to consistently engage and drive um, support for candidates to get good policy. So that's a bit about me, my angle, uh, where I'm coming from yes. uh, when it comes to politics. And then beyond that, I'm also I'm a member of Twin Cities DSA. Uh, I was uh, actually a delegate to the DSA's National Convention last year uh, in Chicago, same venue, one of the same venues actually that the the uh, Democratic National Convention. Oh wow! Okay. Summer. So, oh uh, yeah, I'm slightly familiar already and kind of got a little prepared. So yeah, yeah, I uh, I just officially joined DSA, which is funny. I've been like you know I've been skirting around the outsides you know for a while, but I mean it's a big enough tent uh, you know that I decided I was up in Duluth. Uh, watching a film on Palestine um, and mm -hmm. talking to some folks. And I decided like, there's so much stuff going on in different places. The DSA is organizing like local campaigns. I decided to join. And now I just have to decide how involved in uh, DSA I'm going to be. And when, you know, kind of what area, how I want to, how and when I want to plug into stuff. Um, so we'll see how that goes. I want to, I'm going to, it try really is kind of like a choose your own adventure thing. <laughs> yeah. DSA member. Because, well, and there's a lot of local stuff too. Like I said, I no. mean, even if you like the, you know, the Democratic Party is does not excite you in some ways, then you know there's a lot of like lo like immediate local campaigns that are, um, you know, that folks are getting involved in. And I meet so many people that are in the DS in DSA, so it just seems like it makes sense to, um, to connect on that. So speaking of which, yeah, I you know I and I think there's other people that aren't as you know super familiar with how. Um, the convention stuff works uh, for uh, the Democratic Party. Uh, I mean, to a certain degree, we understand, but as far as especially when it gets to this uncommitted stuff, which hasn't really been like as much part of it in the past. Um, so I guess the question, the first question is like, um, what does it mean to be an uncommitted delegate? Um, and then how did how did you become one? And and where does you know how many delegates are there total, and where do you fit into that? picture do you want to start off with that piece yeah so um i'll start with your first what does it mean to be a delegate so right. uh dele so you know we have primaries and caucuses democratic party has them republican party has them third parties have forms of these sometimes they have one run through state or they have other ways right and these are all feeding into a system of electing delegates so in minnesota uh, our presidential primary was on March 5th. That was Super Tuesday. And uh, 
all of that, there's like some math and formulas. I can go into the specifics uh, kind of as you wish, but uh, that allocates certain delegates to certain candidates uh, roughly proportionally. Mm. Uh, and uncommitted did well enough in the presidential primary in Minnesota on March 5th in Minnesota to win us 11 delegates out of the 75 pledged delegates from Minnesota to the Democratic National Convention. That's because uncommitted got 19% of the vote in the okay. state. Biden got in the uh, 70s something, and then Dean Biden, or uh, not Dean Biden, Dean Phillips, Dean Phillips uh, yeah. got uh, in the high high single digits. And so the way it maths out is Dean didn't get delegates because he did not break 15% either mm. statewide or in any congressional district. However, uncommitted in Minnesota did break 15% both statewide and in three congressional districts, most notably the fifth congressional district, which is anchored by Minneapolis. Uh, our Congresswoman here is Ilhan Omar and uh, uncommitted got about 30 something percent of the vote in the fifth congressional district. Now there's some math and formulas that determine how many delegates each district gets, how they're allocated on the statewide level. The big idea is that if more Democrats live in an area, uh, that area gets more delegates. So mm. the seventh congressional district, uh, it's now a Republican stronghold in Minnesota, that gets three delegates to the Democratic National Convention, um, as opposed to nine for the fifth congressional district. We have like three times as many oh, people sure. who vote Democrat in elections. So the idea, right, is that this is a system that has developed over time to infuse Democratic elements and aspects and flavors into, um, but it's backfilling in what is still essentially the same party convention system that emerged uh, in the 1800s in the United States. So there's a direct continuity from, you know, the first Democratic National Convention with Andrew Jackson to present. And what it is, is it's delegates from states that then go to the National Convention and make a decision. Now, the politics of that have changed incredibly over time. We already know that Joe Biden, if he does not drop out, which is a whole other country. Right, we'll right, 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 right. Um, we already know that Joe Biden, based on the math, is going to be the nominee. He's got more than 3,000 delegates that are pledged to him that have been elected through various states based on their primary or caucus results. Uh, and so we're in a unique position as the uncommitted delegates. We have 11 from Minnesota. There are 35, just 35 in the country. But we collectively afford, uh, represent 738,000 Democratic primary voters and nearly three quarters of a million Democrats or people who vote in Democratic primaries right. selected, uncommitted, uninstructed, or something like that. Um, in their uh, presidential primary ballots over the last several months. Uh, and so because of the math, because a lot in most states, they did not reach 15% to get statewide delegates. Um, so you have a lot of states coming in at like 8, 9, 12%, um, which is a significant protest vote, right? Right. Uh, to say the least of what it shows is the lack of confidence of a lot of um, uh, Democratic voters in Joe Biden. Um, and so uh, in Minnesota, uh, in every state's a little different, but generally we send delegates to the national convention. Um, I already mentioned that there's some, they're, they're allocated in different ways, but you get some on the congressional district level or the district level, and you get some that are statewide. Okay. So in Minnesota, we divide it by congressional districts. So in the fifth congressional district, six delegates were elected for Joe Biden, three were elected for uncommitted because that was the rough proportion of the what the primary election sure. result was in that district. Now, the way we do it is we uh, elect them through sub-caucusing. This may be something familiar to those who have uh, um, seen the process in like Iowa in presidential years, or we use it very regularly for party things in the DFL here in Minnesota. Um, but that means is that the convention itself will separate into distinct groups. All the Joe Biden supporters are in one area. All mm -hmm. of the uncommitted folks are in another area. And then they within themselves select their delegates. That's how you get delegates that 
um, you know, uh, faithfully represent the people uh, and like the candidate is because right. they've been vetted and selected by their own. And what we did in Minnesota and what's been done in uh, most places in the country that elect national delegates is we very thoughtfully recruited and put together a slate of vetted candidates who were prepared nice. to um, be 100% in for free Palestine and to carry the message to the Democratic National Convention. And so uh, everywhere that we had prepared and put up candidates, we won. Um, we know that at least 10 of the uncommitted delegates uh, from Minnesota are 100% in. And uh, we are then, you know, we're, we're meeting and working with uncommitted delegates from across the country. And also, there's a lot of uh, Biden delegates who are pro ceasefire, who know that this is a genocide uh, mm -hmm. being perpetrated by Israel and is being funded and supplied by the United States. And uh, they want Joe Biden to stop as well. Right. So um, there's there's a there's a lot of positions people are coming into this. But what right. happens then is that we then go to Chicago this August. We are delegates to the Democratic National Convention. There are more than 4000 delegates, mathematically 35 people. That's less than one percent. Right. I mean, did the squat in the mean in, in the terms of like. The decisions themselves, mathematically, will Joe Biden be the nomination? Will their preferred platform you know, in the form they want, pass, yes mm -hmm. or no. Uh, but uh, there's a lot of opportunities to do things around the margin. And the honest thing, you know, uh, it may sound slightly conceited, is that the uncommitted delegates are the most interesting story at the Democratic National Convention because mm -hmm. the National Convention is, um, you know, we, the way we, the way uh, most people on the outside, the public experiences the National Convention it's just a week of pageantry and speeches, honestly. Right. Highly, it's a highly produced uh, program. Uh, and this is how it's evolved over time. Historically, right, when I talk about that direct continuity from the past to the present mm -hmm. of these conventions, you know, um, there have been national conventions that dragged on for multiple weeks where there were over 100 ballots taken because there was that much disagreement. Right. This was in an era when state parties and local parties uh, were much more powerful. Uh, it uh, And so they did a lot of horse trading. It was an actual dynamic environment. And that isn't to say it's democratic per se, because it wasn't truly representative. I mean, like this, right. was, this was like the party of slavery right. in the last century. And it changed over time, but it wasn't quick and immediate. And those vast tensions in the party would come into play at national conventions. And so uh, there has been, um, you know, this has been on display at, at many points in the history of the Democratic Party. Uh, you know, one of the notable ones is 1964, where uh, Mississippi, uh, a segregationist Democratic Party, Black Black people were not permitted to participate in mm. the Mississippi Democratic Party. Right. Uh, but they still sent delegates to the national convention and this is in an era right where uh the democratic party was turning a page on civil rights reaching a new consensus of you know as as what is it humphrey said stepping out of the era of states rights and into the the era of like human civil rights or, or the like and so these tensions were there and uh there was an alternative set of elect of delegates sent to the 1964 democratic national convention from mississippi these were from the newly organized Mississippi Freedom Democratic Party. It was mm -hmm. a uh, a newly organized party. They held caucuses, local conventions, um, and it had uh, it, uh, it it was um, it, it was sort of like a this is like Fannie Lou Hammer Rainbow, and stuff, like right? Free Rainbow Coalition kind of thing, like it. Um, but it, it had black leadership in the party. That came out of like Fannie Lou Hammer and stuff like that, right? Exactly. Okay, yep, yeah, Fannie yeah. Lou Hammer. And so they went to the national convention. Right. And then the way that they were able to get their meds, you're, you're talking about a small number of people to a national right. convention. And yet this is the story of the 1964 National Convention, because they made the case to the credentials committee that the delegates from the segregationist Democratic Party from Mississippi were not legitimate. Mm. And they, so they did not succeed in making the case there. But it happened to be that one of the delegates from Minnesota smuggled and took a bunch of credentials, smuggled them out of the convention, gave them to the members of the Mississippi Freedom Dele uh, Delegation, so they were still able to get inside the building. Mm. This is part of like the history and possibility right. of what can happen at conventions. 
Now, we are in an era now where everything is very known. It's predictable. Right. You know, um, and we would, you know, rightfully as a public be uh um uh find it uh absurd and anti-democratic if like, you know, the results of the primaries were disregarded mm. and it was a, it was just a free for all. Right. Uh, but um that is still technically legally possible. All it takes is Joe Biden withdrawing from the race. And that releases all of the delegates that have been pledged for him, and mm-hmm. they suddenly have a free vote on who to who to vote for president, um, for presidential nomination to to be the right. candidate of the party. And the, the I, I would not put it as a like high likelihood that we would right. open a convention, but all, all to say is that it is possible. And even short of that, and you know, just for the sake of the party, it's it's probably not good. <laughs> Um, mm. you know, as someone who has that interest in like maintaining some sense of unity in the party, just for the sake of us being able to win elections, um, mm. to keep box Republicans out of power, uh, that, uh, it would it it would not be good. But the thing is, we're in a very bad place right now as the Democratic Party with Joe Biden as the top of the ticket. And uh, there's, you know, it's been all over like the news of like Democratic Party operatives and people going to the White House and, you know, people having private conversations saying the president should withdraw. And all of this is kind of a drip, drip, drip accumulation that it could right. result in something different than everyone thinks is most likely happening. Right now. So I kind of rambled on and on. No, but, that's all right. You know, there's a, there's a, there's a lot that goes into this. And then, you know, I can talk more, about more detailed stuff like rules committee, credentials committee, um, you know, as the uncommitted delegation, we are going to be doing like press conferences and all of this. We're, um, we're going to have, we're going to be like attached by the right. hip to press uh, to tell the story um, and remind folks that this isn't about like us as well. This is about Palestine. This is right. Gaza, um, and this is to, to, and our complicity as as United States government in, in in continuing this. And just just to go back to Minnesota real quick. So you said of the all the delegates out, out of Minnesota, so there's 75 and 11 of them are the uncommitted delegates. Is that accurate? Uh, there are 75 pledged delegates, uh, okay. and 11 of them are uncommitted. Now there's another category of delegates. They are uh, unpledged automatic delegates. These are more commonly known as super delegates. So these right, are going to okay. be members of Congress, your Democratic mm-hmm. governor. Your former vice presidents, if you have them, um, your state party chairs and vice chairs, and your members of your Democratic National Committee. For so, Michigan. how many people is that? Do we have a Do we have an idea? All together, that... that makes it. That's about twenty ish. All together, that makes a delegation. I believe it's ninety six in total. What you should know, though, is one of the reforms that came out of twenty sixteen and was cemented in party rules in twenty twenty, um, to become permanent rules, which continue now is. Uh, Everyone remembers the super del- delegates endorsing uh, Hillary Clinton twenty sixteen right. before any of the voters in their state, right? And we we understood that to be undemocratic and right. really be putting a thumb on the scale um, rather than them representing the voters in their state. And so the rule was changed that on the first ballot for Democratic for for choosing the nominee, uh, the su- the automatic delegates or the super delegates, as more commonly known, mm-hmm. they don't vote on the first okay. ballot only. And this is to be, if we have pledged delegates, we hold caucuses and primaries around the country. Like this is the math being reported on like CNN and like Ballotpedia and like all of the places to track who's going to be the nominee because they they won, right? They right. won. Um, and so the outcome was almost always known. And that's why the super delegates are removed from that. But the backup and contingency is built into the rules. If we have an open convention, all those people come back into play. Your members of Congress, your state party chairs, the members of the Democratic National Committee mm-hmm. and other party, distinguished party leaders and dignitaries. And that's where, right, you have the people that represent these voters, people like me who represent the uncommitted voters. And then you have the people who represent like, I mean, who are the members of Congress represent that wing of the party and the institution itself. So just one more question about Minnesota, and then I do want to talk more about the the, the um, convention. Um, so that 19 point whatever percent, I think it was, for the uncommitted in Minnesota, as a percentage, that was the largest percentage in the country, wasn't it? 
uh, was in yeah, Minnesota? Uh, of, of a primary, yes, that's correct. So okay. we had the largest delegation, and uh, it was the highest uh, percent uh, result for uncommitted in a primary. And, the, and, uh, the uh, Hawaii has a distinction. They had a caucus instead of okay, primary. Sure. Um, and that's, they had like a, uh, that's how they conducted that balloting. Sure. Um, and so they had a higher percent. It was, I think I was like 20 or 30 something percent. Okay. Um, the, but the, the difference is they had much, much lower participation. Oh, sure. Okay. Yep. Well, that's interesting to know. But yeah, so Minnesota, Hawaii playing uh, crucial roles in that process. Um, so let's see. I, I want to talk a little bit about the Biden piece and I want to talk a little bit about the specifically about the uncommitted piece. But um, so, okay. So, so since this debate, um that took place with biden i mean there's been a lot more like panic in the media and calling for you know biden to step aside and that they need somebody else um you know and this is something this isn't like something that just came up there's been people concerned about uh biden's abilities in addition obviously to the his continuation of the genocide for a while i guess why why is why is this coming up in such a big way now is it just people see it as an opportunity and 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 then if you know if biden if the if 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 biden stepping aside is not the likely um you know outcome what uh i guess what what is it that the uncommitted delegates um what is the highest goal i guess kind of that that could be achieved by uncommitted delegates as far as you um see at the convention Yeah, why is this coming up now? Yeah. Um, so I, I, you know, I guess I wouldn't say I've been someone who has been really concerned sure. about Biden's age or his like uh, mental acuity or sure. something like that. Um, frankly, because like it's it's the staff who do the real stuff. The president right. just sort of prompted. Mm-hmm. Right. Um, and so the people who are concerned about it are using but, but this the as thing, their but, opportunity but, to. Well, here's the thing: is that I or is it so the media? <laughs> I I, I could I, I did not watch the full debate. To be sure. clear, I watched yeah. some of it. I couldn't stand it anymore. Right. I things to begin with, mm -hmm. I shut it off. It was too painful. I, Very I, fair. I, I could tell it was over before it began. Um, but why is this coming up now? It was on display for everyone to see in a way that really couldn't be denied because sure. it wasn't just Trump you know, rolling like a bunch of like splice images of like Biden sort of in an awkward stance or tripping or, or like the, the weird sort of greatest hits, whatever, to make him look like a feeble old man. Well, right. What people saw in that debate was, um, well, one, they saw Trump lying his ass off. I don't, can I say that word on your yeah. podcast? Uh, sure. Lying his ass off left and right. Uh, and for those who are like concerned and, and thinking about that, that was obvious, right? He's a liar. He's he's a fascist. Like Trump's a terrible person, um, but he said everything he did in a way that was confident, and he's a showman. And right. so that that has like it short circuits some of the logic in our brain because it has that that pathos, that emotional appeal. And on the flip side, uh, you look at Biden, and um, well, I agree more with his positions. There are things also that are uh, lies in in different ways, and perhaps less openly omnicious and uh, openly um, uh, malicious, right? And uh, on clearly on display and just like flagrantly falsifiable, uh, but the type of political deception, nonetheless. Um, that you know, I, I would just. I would just consider kind of a baseline standard in national politics, like, and I and I don't really I don't want to splice that too much. Sure. Um, so, th th but so so for some people, right, that resonates. Like you hear the arguments Biden was making, even if he didn't articulate it well, you knew what he was talking about. You knew, you know, if he mentioned defeating Medicare, he probably talk about like defeating like a tax on Medicare or something. Like sure. you can kind of get what it is, right? right. Um. So there was some logical appeal to some people, and then there was none of that kind of emotional appeal that firing people up. And the thing is, the narrative of Biden not being, it you know, and you can divide it, uh, being capable of governing as president and then being capable of campaigning and winning in a 
way, you know, and like those right. are two different tasks. The president has to do both of them if he's running for re-election, but they require different things. Um, and what what I think a lot of Democrats saw is they saw the debate and maybe they've had confidence in Biden's ability to govern and no question, maybe they still do. But they freaked out because they saw that this is a huge threat to his ability to campaign. It cemented a narrative that was already very hard to overcome. Mm -hmm. And uh, suddenly everyone's saying, oh shit, oh shit. Something's got to be done. The question is, when will someone be that person who does something about it? Who will be like the first sitting member of Congress to openly say, right? Because they're all right. talking about it behind closed doors. They're whispering about it to each other on the floor of the House of Representatives. Like th this is happening in caucus meetings. This is happening in back offices. I am talking to people like I'm I'm not right. I'm, I'm far on the periphery of this. Mm -hmm. I'm just like a, a member of the state executive <laughs> committee, Minnesota. Right. But like everyone is talking about it and mm -hmm. i'm talking about like the people who are like the worker horses and, and the workhorses and the, and the worker bees of the party who are running campaigns who have to be writing the scripts on the or for for canvassers to be going on the doors what is the message how right. do we speak to the president how can we campaign for him without throwing our own credibility in the trash and having it drag down all the other democratic candidates that we need to win right so why is this coming up now it's because it's hitting us in the face and it can't really be ignored any longer i mean we've just been confronted with it and time is running out in short if there's going to be a change in the ticket it, it's just there's it's weeks away at this point sure so uh so i mean i heard on the radio earlier you know biden met with his family or whatever they all talked him out of any any talk even about you know dropping out or changing out candidates and so he's in it all the way you know that's that was the message on the radio when i was just out yeah. driving around um, so just assuming, you know, Biden's not going to drop out, you know, there's not, there's no like Biden going away. That's going to happen. So what you mentioned it a little bit, do you want to just talk a little bit more about like, you know, um, what are the goals as far as like uncommitted delegates you talked about, you know, talking to the press, making it the story of the event or the, and what other things are there within the, you know, the process there, you said on the peripheries that y'all can do to, um, to really push, uh, forward on the, uh, Palestine uh, solidarity issue and to speak to the ongoing genocide. Do you want to just talk about that a little bit? Yeah. So uh, there's a couple things we have in mind here. Um, you know, the the uh, I think an overarching one is um, you know we're here for Palestine. We are here to end the genocide, and uh, it's you know the the uncommitted campaign has been clear nationally from the beginning. That we don't want Trump to win. We right. want to make sure that a Republican doesn't hold the White House. The problem is that Biden has chosen a course which is self-defeating and cannot win because it is alienating a huge swath of voters that the Democrats need to win elections, including in states like Michigan, where the margin of, of win oh, for Biden last hold on one second, you're breaking up just a little bit. Number of there. Votes. Sorry. I don't know what's going on. Okay. All right. Yeah, yeah. So you were saying he needs these voters. Uh, Biden to win. needs these voters to win. He needs them in Michigan. He needs them in Minnesota, even. Yep. Right to win. Um, and so, uh, there's that. There, there's, there's that. There's that is that Biden's policy on Israel and Palestine makes him possible to win. The so what we want, what we want is we want him to change course and policy. So there, there, there's specifics, right? We need an immediate and permanent ceasefire, massive humanitarian aid, release of hostages and political prisoners. Uh, we need self determination for for the Palestinian people, uh, and 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 like you know we need to stop arms shipments. We need to stop. Uh, unconditional aid. Some of us would say no aid at all at this point. There's just no reason whatsoever to provide any uh, aid for Israel. And so that that would be the best goal is to save lives, is to stop funding and supplying uh, these atrocities. And so um, then the path is how do we get there? And right. so it's 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 
you know, like I mentioned earlier, we are less than 1% of the delegates to the convention. Numerically, in terms of the voting, it's not going to be there. Right. The path is getting the story out. It is uh, telling the stories of children who have been martyred in Gaza. It is uh, organizing with other delegates there who are there for Joe Biden to uh, support a ceasefire in the party platform. Um, that would be one of the tangible things that, you know, even if it doesn't succeed, uh, making a good effort at it could be a good showing in votes, which would change the narrative when usually the party platform is handed down without edits from the president. So uh, we have, uh, you know, I won't go too into the specifics sure. just because there's some internal strategy that we're Right. Yeah, I get I, 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 I no, I get that. I get that. I, I was going to I was going to preface the question with that, but I just wanted to throw it out there and let you share whatever you think is uh, appropriate yep. to share at this point. Yep. And then. Uh... I think the media piece is a big piece, obviously, and you, yep. you know, like there's been a lot of examples of the media or other activists or whatever, trying to talk to some of the uh, people that are in power within the Democratic Party about this. And of course, they don't, a lot of times they don't get the time of day and you see them like chasing the people down the hall and all that stuff. So, right. I mean, this will be a chance for uh, these uncommitted delegates to be face to face with other delegates that represent other um, potentially other positions or other people. And you'll Certainly. kind of have access to them. Certainly. So that and will we, be key. we know that there's going to be eyes on us. Right. I mean, we're going to be wearing proudly our, our kofias. Mm -hmm. We will be visibly there as the uncommitted delegates, there will be no mistaking who we are and why we're there. Well, the, um, and, and then, you know, we haven't mentioned this yet. Uh, there's going to be huge protests outside. There's right. thousands and thousands and thousands of people coming to Chicago mm -hmm. to protest for this issue. And what more, you know, when, when this was pointed out and I realized it, it brought me to tears. It's 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 extremely humbling, and it makes the the um the enormity and importance of this this task all the more like all the more um elevated is understanding that people there will there will be people in Gaza watching us. We're there for them, and so right. that is <laughs> overwhelming. I think in many right. ways to contemplate, but. there you know we have to try and mm -hmm. that's the thing is like when it comes to the democratic party i am no stranger to being in a minority position as a socialist who is both mm -hmm. proudly a socialist and a democrat and mm -hmm. for me it's I, I i've never i know probably a number of the listeners here would see a great contradiction or conflict in that for me there has never been one um in many ways because of how our dfl party is here in minnesota um the party is the people who show up to caucus, who become delegates. And by organizing well, we have uh, solidified the presence and power of the left through Minnesota's uh, party system. Doesn't mean we win everything. I'm used to, like I said, I'm used to being in a minority position in a room, but um, it, it is understanding that the Democratic Party is not the only, but it is an arena to contest power in. And it's one that I've chosen to not leave uncontested and to uh, bring the fight to basically the doorstep of one of the two parties of the heart of the empire um, to answer for this and uh, to continually push and show that there's an alternative because the the the, the truth is, right, um, a lot of people who vote for Democratic candidates, however flawed those candidates are, a lot of those voters are um, very progressive or uh, socialists or they uh, care um, and prioritize support for labor unions and economic justice issues. Um, it, it's not like th there's there's a hunger for an alternative. And I've. I'm showing up to provide and articulate that alternative, rally people around it, and then take power for it. Um, because the alternative is to walk away from that arena and leave it uncontested and thus have no power there. 
And oftentimes when we walk out, we are leaving power and not gaining anything in return, um, except perhaps being able to live with ourselves. And um, that unfortunately does not change the world <laughs> uh, alone, um, unless we take that and build something else and new. Um, when it comes to the party, the, the position of the president of the United States, I, you know, and this is a great critique of the Green Party, for example, you spend all this effort running candidates for presidential, you know, for president, um, and maintaining ballot lines, and then um, the the all the other things that need that I would consider that a manifestation of party building rather than like the goal or the means itself to then backfill and build in a grassroots party to take local offices to then advance an agenda that way. So it, you know it's a it's a sense, and that's why I'm an active Twin Cities DSA member as well, uh, and I'm active in some other organizations uh to keep me hopefully a little bit well-rounded uh but uh to also be kind of a translator uh for a lot of folks on the left who take it you know right in, in, in many ways quite justifiably um want to take a step back from all of that don't want to essentially get in the mess and the ick and the corruption of the democratic party right um but what what i've been able to do in like this this national convention was one of the things in which i'm applying this is taking all of the accumulated knowledge of the last almost decade of working within the party and and using that as like a key to unlock power to know how the credentials committee works at the national convention to make sure that they don't mess with our delegates and everyone is properly seated um for example in missouri there's uh, uh two or three uh, three uncommitted delegates from the state and they're trying to force the delegates to sign a non-disclosure agreement and memorandum of understanding that among other things would stipulate that they are prohibited from speaking to media unless mm. it's legally approved by Bad. the party's communication director and also regulating what they may wear and the style of clothing they may wear. So, and so like, no, right. uh, they are properly elected, duly elected delegates to the national convention and if their state party tries to like mess with their credentials or whatever, that's why we have someone. So we have someone on the credentials committee. We have someone on the rules committee who's with uncommitted to make sure that we uh, keep them and protect the delegates so that they don't mess with us. Uh, the, you know, socialists, if they want to fight for what is right, they're going to find themselves in the minority sometimes if you're not just going with the flow. So we all got to get used to that. And so socialists need to get, you know, I agree. Socialists need to get used to, uh, fighting, you know, for minority positions, being in minority positions within the institutions that they uh, are involved in, wherever that may be. So I really appreciate you speaking with me. Thanks so much. Good luck with your work shining a light on the situation in Palestine during the Democratic National Convention. And that's our special interview. Thanks for listening. Solidarity. This has been a Socialist News and Views special interview.